It's not in. Resuming debate. The Honourable on Sable Island. Resuming debate. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Strathcona. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, at the outset, I wish to seek unanimous consent to split my spot. The Honourable Member for Order. Does the Honourable Men Member for Edmonton Strathcona have the unanimous consent of the House to share her time? Yes. Yes? Agreed? Agreed and so ordered. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Strathcona. That, I will be splitting my time with the Member for Riviere des Mille Isles. Um, it's my pleasure uh, to speak on this bill. Um, the designation as a full national park for Sable Island has been long in coming and is welcomed by many quarters. Nonetheless, <coughs> there have been a number of outstanding issues and it appears that all the parties have come together to a certain extent to resolve those matters. But it has been discussed in the House around the comments by the Parliamentary Secretary. Um, there may still be a need for some discussion at committee um, but what our party certainly does not want to do in any way is to slow down or to stop the full designation as a national park of Sable Island. Uh, Mr. Speaker, Sable Island is a very unique uh, area. It's a sandbar island off the coast of Nova Scotia, uh, over 40 kilometers long, only 1.3 kilometers wide uh, at the widest point. It's home to 190 plant species, including 20 Restrict, restricted distribution not found elsewhere, and a remarkable herd of 450 wild horses. Uh, Mr. Speaker, it was this herd of horses that first brought the efforts to conserve this island and protect their habitat. But since that date and time, there have been many more revelations about the importance and significance and uniqueness of this island. And uh, it is good news that all parties have come together to try to designate and set aside this area for future prosperity. To that end, uh, this Act declares Sable Island um, Park Reserve to be a full national park, and that means it shifts to the full protection. Um, but as some of the members have indicated in the House, in some extent there are some questions about uh, the extent of that full protection. It's my understanding, Mr. Speaker, that similar conditions that were put on um, other parks such as Haida Gwaii, Nahani and so forth are being imposed on Sable Island National Park or will be imposed when it is designated and those, that includes allowing for uh, uh, First Nation harvest rights and so forth. Um, but there are additional problems which I'm quite familiar with when I was Assistant Deputy of Natural Resources in the Yukon and that was during the time when the majority of the First Nation final agreements were being negotiated and that deals with the issue of uh, pre-existing uh, mineral rights and interests. And so this legislation attempts to deal with those potentially conflicting rights and interests and also the jurisdiction and power of the Nova Scotia Offshore Petroleum Resource Accord Implementation Act. Um, I won't go into the detail of those provisions. I think that those will be discussed hopefully at committee should the bill be voted to go uh, to committee. Um, but I think that those are the issues that need to be clarified and resolved to what extent uh, the pre-existing rights will be honoured. It's my understanding, Mr. Speaker, that in designating the park, the decision is that uh, there will no longer be any right to actually extract petroleum resources on Sable Island or within a perimeter of, I think it's one mile uh, offshore. The problem is, is that there is considerable offshore oil activity in this vicinity and the potential for direct, indirect di drilling. So uh, the question that was raised, I believe, by uh, one of my colleagues is about this term about uh, low impact. Um, the law would allow for certain low impact activities to occur. Unfortunately, the legislation doesn't really specify what those are. I'm sure that will be a matter for discussion and debate at committee, and I look forward to the presentations by other members on that aspect. It also amends the Canada Shipping Act, transfers jurisdiction uh, from the Coast Guard to Parks Canada. Now, one of the outstanding issues, Mr. Speaker, and I look forward to this being addressed uh, fully, um, interestingly, the preamble of the bill designating uh, Sable Island National Park gives reference to uh, the Mi'kmaq um, asserted right and title. But the problem is a preamble is not legally binding. And so it may well be that they may want to pursue some kind of substantive provision within 
uh, the Act or associated regulations or so forth to actually clarify that those rights are recognized. Why is that important? Because there has been free, there have been previous uh, determinations by the federal court that previously this government erred in law by making decisions on the protection of habitat uh, of species um, without giving due consideration to Aboriginal right and title. Uh, I note that the chief of the Pakhtun Kek First Nation, who is one of the Mi'kmaq nations, advises they have not in fact been consulted. Perhaps that has happened since he stated that. They are calling for more in-depth archaeological studies on the island connected to their previous occupation and uh, I'm sure that they may be brought forward to committee. Um, the Conservatives initially wanted to make the designation subject to all other federal laws. This was a rather reprehensible proposal because all other national parks have said the opposite, that the National Parks Act would supersede all other laws, which is obviously important when you're designating an area for protection. My understanding is they have withdrawn from that uh, uh, suggestion, and I look forward to being clarified on that. Uh, Mr. Speaker, finally, I'd like to speak to the parts of the, of the bill that deal with changes to Jasper National Park. Now, as the Parliamentary Secretary had said, um, it, for uh, Jasper National Park, it deals with an a exchange of properties to allow for the Marmot Basin Ski um, Project to potentially develop in the future. And presumably, there was some kind of evaluation and assessment in this exchange that, they, that Marmot uh, Ski Development would give up uh, areas that are more uh, ecologically sensitive for ones that are less ecologically sensitive. I can't speak to that in detail. Um, I'm not sure who was engaged in that review. I don't know if it was an open uh, uh, review, but I look forward to more detail being provided on that in committee. Um, it's absolutely critical because under the National Parks Act, uh, the minister is obligated to give priority to ecological integrity in making any decisions about the management of the parks. So. Um, that is potentially a matter that might come forward. My understanding is um, nobody has specifically objected to the switch of the lands, but there are ongoing concerns. Why is that? Because there are a number of threatened species that are uh, potentially at risk. Uh, caribou, uh, this is the last three of four herds in Jasper National Park are close to extirpation. Um, that is, those are the last remaining herds that have any level of protection in my province. Uh, essentially, all the eastern slope herds, the provincial government have declared, let them be extirpated, and most of the, and all of the herds in northern Alberta where the oil sands developments are occurring. So there is a lot of attention on the commitment by the federal government to step up to the plate and ensure that this last remnant caribou herd gets the full protections. Um, again, as I mentioned, Mr. Speaker, uh, in a previous court case brought by a number of Alberta First Nations, because of the federal government's failure to actually directly consult and consider any impacts on uh, First Nation right and title in deciding whether or not to protect the critical ha habitat of the woodland caribou, uh, the minister erred in law by determining he didn't have to consult and consider those rights. Uh, the federal court thoroughly chastised the minister and said, you have erred in law, and this matter has continued to sort of spin round and round. Um, According to uh, Parks Policy, the ski operators must demonstrate a substantial environmental gain from their plans. And so what um, all people who are interested in the protection of this area will be watching for is under the new regime for the Canadian Environmental Assessment Act, will there be a thorough environmental assessment of any plans to expand in this area that uh, they will be allowed to expand into? And will Canadians who are concerned and dedicated to the protection of the species in that area be allowed to fully participate. Um, the government has been moving to try to limit the participation by Canadians. I would think this is a good chance to show and exercise a goodwill and be forthright and say, we intend to ensure a full environmental assessment and full participation by people, even if we don't deem that they are directly uh, impacted. Um, I would just like to close, Mr. Speaker, um, with some of the words of Alison Woodley, who is the Director of Conservation for Canadian Parks and Wilderness Association. Uh, she had said that Parks Canada policy requires an operator to demonstrate there will be a substantial environmental gain in the overall plan. In our view, it's highly unlikely there will be a substantial environmental gain achieved through the Mar Marmot Basin ski expansion, and it could cause harm to park wildlife, including woodland caribou, uh, again, who have dropped critically low numbers in the park and at risk of disappearing. So um, I think that uh, there is goodwill on all parties. 
but I think that there are still significant questions remaining, and I think that the ball is in the court of the government to step forward in both of these matters and assure the public and those concerned that those matters will be addressed and we will protect the integrity of our national parks. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Questions and comments? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of the Environment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I, I thank my colleague uh, for her very thoughtful comments on this debate. I think that there are um, opportunities for us to, to drill into some of these issues in committee. And, um, you know, I'm very glad to hear today that we're having a productive and very respectful debate on an important subject, which is this park. I wanted to address one of the areas that she brought up with regard to uh, the low impact, the definition of low impact uh, exploration activities. I believe one of my colleagues also brought this up in a question. Um, some of the examples that I think uh, have been raised in previous uh, study of this bill have been um, around the Canada Nova Scotia Offshore Petroleum Board issuing a call for bids that include, a sub, uh, that include the subsurface of sable from time to time um, and, and a company that has a successful bid needing to access the island to undertake activities to further refine its understanding of the petroleum potential in the greater sable island area. So I think the last time something like this happened was in 1999. Uh, a company undertook a 3D seismic program where it temporarily installed listening devices and vibrating devices to provide a sound source. Um, but this particular activity was subject to permitting, etc. Is this the type of information, that level of specificity that she would be expecting in a committee study and would be looking forward to engaging in? Honourable Member for Edmonton Strathcona. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary for her incisive question. Uh, I think that, what, frankly, what I would be looking for as an environmental lawyer, I would be looking for uh, clarification right in law. Um, the problem is, yes, there is a listing of activities, but then there's this wide open uh, bucket of things that could occur, which is called low impact activities. I think that the one provision that's of greatest concern is petroleum exploration activities of low environmental impact. Well, what is that? Um, if you talk to the oil and gas industry, they would many of them would say there's absolutely no impact because we manage blah, blah, blah safely. Um, given how small this area is and obviously very sensitive, um, I think that there is a need for some kind of very specific definition to give assurance to everybody into the future. And uh, what legal mechanism can come up with? I look forward to the innovative ideas of the Government of Canada. Questions and comments? Question and the Honourable Member for Rivière des Mirilles. I'd like to thank my Honourable Colleague for her speech. It's clear that she knows uh, the issue and has a good background in the environment. I have a question about what the Conservatives have done with national parks in the past. We know Questions and comments? Question and commentaire. Member for Edmonton Strathcona. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'd like to thank my honourable colleague uh, for her dedicated work uh, on environmental measures uh, in the federal area. And thank you for her question. Um, she raises actually a big issue, and not just about the interpretation of the area, but the recent very deep cuts to scientists, interpreters, and so forth um, for Environment Canada and for Parks Canada. And given that both of these matters, and also Yoho Park, which I didn't speak to, are matters where there will need to be a high level of scientific scrutiny and close monitoring, it does raise the concern. Uh, Sable Island, as the Parliamentary Secretary spoke in the bill, said uh, it's a terrain that is changing all the time and there are hundreds of, of unique plant species and so forth there. Who's going to be monitoring this? Who's going to be monitoring 
and watchdogging these so-called low impact environmental uh, impacts. And for the ski area, um, I guess we're going to want some assurance of who is going to be brought in to actually do this close evaluation of any future expansions of the industrial, not the industrial, the commercial activities of, this, of skiing into another part, part, part of the park. So we're going to need assurances that if they don't have the scientists in house anymore, there's going to be access and they're going to draw upon independent scientists, many of whom wonderful uh, qualified scientists we have in Alberta. Resuming debate, please the debate. Uh, the Honourable Member for Rivière des Milles. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank my colleague from Edmonton, Strathcona, who spoke before me. She gave an a, a great overview of Bill S-15. But it's a pleasure for me to rise in the House to speak to this Bill S-15, which comes from the Senate. We know that the federal government entered into an agreement with the Nova Scotia government. So this bill was drafted in connection with that agreement. Basically, this bill would make uh, Sable Island a national park. Contrary to the designation of a national park, which would not allow for Aboriginal land claims, this designation will allow the government to pursue negotiations of the land claim. This is a very important detail because we know that the island is currently covered by a land claim. So we have to recognize the presence of First Nations on the territory that is now known as Canada. And as my colleague for Edmonton Strathcona said, we have to make sure that these considerations are dealt with appropriately and we need to make way for First Nations to express themselves on this issue. This bill is not enforceable, so we have to make sure that First Nations rights are respected when this bill is implemented. All members in this House have said that Sable Island is something that Canadians should be proud of. Canadians across the country, this is a long, narrow, crescent-shaped island southeast of Nova Scotia. It's, uh, a, the, the wild horses are the most famous residents of the island. There are over 190 plant species and 350 bird species on Sable Island. That's another important reason for protecting this island, which is a true jewel in our ecological crown. I'd like to take a moment here to pay tribute to the staff of the Interpretation Centre in my riding in Rivière des Mille. We have a natural woodland in our riding on the shores of the Milil River. And thanks to this reserve, our children and generation and future generations will be able to benefit from our flora and fauna. So I'd like to thank them for their hard work in conservation, because that's what we're talking about this afternoon. As I said before, it's thanks to people like that who work to ensure that our natural resources are protected and available to future generations. So we have to, in my view, pay particular attention to the intergenerational transfer issue of uh, our wildlife and uh, natural spaces. The federal government has a duty, therefore, to think of future generations but they've made cuts to a number of national parks in recent years. We know that the federal government has imposed cuts of $29 million on national parks last year, and 600 positions have been cut, guides and other park staff, so they're no longer around in our national parks to share their knowledge 
their scientific and environmental knowledge with Canadians who visit parks all over the country, and in some cases they've been re they've simply been replaced by signs. And the government of Stephen Harper, this prime minister, has failed to take steps to meet targets under the UN Convention on Biodiversity, so they're not really doing their job. Unfortunately, we know that Canada is only protecting 10% of its land mass and 2% of its uh, maritime areas. So we know that our record, the conservative record, is not a very good one. And uh, it's, they're not going to be leaving a very nice legacy to future generations. We also know that the conservative government does not focus on the environment in Canada. They eliminated 99% of the environmental assessments. Mr. Speaker, we can also talk about the suppression of the, the uh, most of the navigable water measures and most of the fish habitat protection. It was also with a great deal of dismay that I learned that this would be the last summer for the uh, Biosphere Museum in Montreal. In July 2012, the Conservative government imposed severe cuts on the biosphere in Montreal, and now it is the turn of most of the personnel to be laid off. We also learned that Environment Canada unilaterally decided to uh, revisit the mandate, which will not survive without its personnel. Those who will be affected will be museologists, facilitators, curators, and technicians. If the Conservative government really cared about the transmission of scientific knowledge to the public, it would not have gone ahead with these unbridled cuts on our parks and museums, which are really national treasures. This being said, I support this bill at second reading because it seeks to protect the history and beauty of Sable Island. I would also like to commend the work of environmental groups which rally to protect this island. And I also support this bill, but it must be mentioned that the drafting of this bill raises a number of concerns. Essentially, as my colleagues have already said, this bill bans drilling for less than 200 nautical miles from the island and uh, the subsurface. But exploration activities will be authorized on the island, which is a first for a national park. These exploration activities will be limited to those uh, that are low impact activities, but we know that this expression is currently not defined in the bill. So in my opinion, the Environment Committee should study this issue to clearly define what low impact exploration activities means to lay out which activities will be encompassed by this definition. We also know that Parks Canada will have to be consulted by the Canada Nova, Canada Nova Scotia Off Offshore Petroleum Board will have to be consulted. The board will have the discretionary power to include cleanup and mitigation measures to mitigate the impacts of proposed projects. So I hope that the Environment Committee will invite a number of experts to properly study the bill. But having sat on the Environment Committee, I can testify to this government's unbalanced approach to conservation. This is a government that muzzles its scientists, that does not listen to experts, and 
that refuses to listen to scientific experts who work on conservation and preservation. We also know that in any committee that has sat during this parliamentary session that the conservative members refuse to adopt any kind, any amendments moved by the opposition. So these are amendments that were drafted based on expert testimony with reliable data that was brought forward before committee. And the purpose of these amendments is to improve and enhance these bills. So I hope that for once the government members will adopt any amendments proposed or rather moved by the NDP who work very hard on this committee. So uh, I will be happy to take any questions from my honorable colleagues. Thank you. Questions and comments. Uh, the honorable parliamentary secretary to the minister of the environment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You know, Mr. Speaker, I, I was encouraged by the tone of debate earlier today, and I, I, I have to express a little bit of disappointment in my colleague in turning into this debate into a partisan speech rather than looking at the form and substance of the bill itself um, as we hopefully take it into committee stage. So I'd like to give her the opportunity to, sp to speak to a specific recommendation uh, that perhaps she would have. Um, and perhaps also uh, take a moment to retract some of the incorrect comments that she made, including the 99% uh, environmental uh, screening component, which the Commissioner of the Environment actually said in C38 subcommittee, uh, that he actually said that 94% of these screenings, I believe, were, the quote was, a majority of these screenings were for very small projects, which there are no significant adverse environmental impacts. The agency has estimated that 94% of screenings would not pose significant adverse environmental impacts. So I'd like her to comment on that statement, as well as perhaps talk about, since she raised it in debate, whether or not, since the Commissioner of the Environment says that 94% of these small screenings do not have significant environmental impact, she believes that that money that is spent on these screenings and time is better spent in no environmental impact than in larger environmental impact assessments where the funding is now going. The Honourable Member. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I would have liked to answer the question put by the Parliamentary Secretary with regard to amendments to the Environmental Assessment Act, but we know that these amendments were included in an omnibus bill last year, which was pushed through by the Conservative government, so we didn't really have enough time to debate the, those changes in this House of Commons. So this is the way that the government refuses to be accountable to Canadians. So obviously there are Canadians across this country who spoke out against the, cha the changes moved by the Conservative government, and we also know that the government gutted or sabotaged the environmental assessment consulta consultation process, and that's what I'm hearing from my constituents. We also know that there are a number of Conservative members in this House who have risen here to talk about this matter, but I would particularly like to hear from the members in the following regions because we know that because of this uh, Conservative government's cuts, so their constituents had to volunteer to do upkeep on the parks. Honourable Member for Bromisisqua. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to thank my colleague from Rivière des Mille for her speech, which was, as always, uh, delivered very well. I would like to ask her, because she talked about this a little bit in her speech, Despite that, the Conservative government of Stephen Harper pledged to respect the uh, UN Convention on Biological Diversity. They pledged to protect at least 17% of uh, land habitat and 10% of uh, marine areas by 2020. but they are dragging their feet because only 10% of uh, land areas and 1% of marine areas are protected so far. I would like my colleague to explain to me why these crucial and 
vital, why it is crucial that these uh, pledges be respected. The Honorable Member. I would like to thank my colleague for the question, and there are many reasons why these pledges are essential. But we know that Canada has become the laughingstock of the international community because it refuses to achieve its uh, targets under international agreements. We could also talk about the uh, Kyoto Protocol, which is an important environmental uh, agreement. And we know that the Minister of Environment withdrew Canada from this protocol in 2011 without consulting Canadians and without even consulting the global community, which was not even aware that Canada was going to pull out of Kyoto at the last minute. So we also know that uh, the government refuses to take positive steps for the environment and uh, waits for a bill to come out of the Senate to finally make some sort of gesture to protect the environment because you know, we know that S15 comes from the Senate. So I would urge the Conservatives to listen to Canadians and environmentalists uh, across this country. Resuming debate, the Honourable Member for Saint-Leonard, Saint-Michel.